Well, good morning. Pleasure to be able to welcome you. Thank you for coming through those strong winds and coming in that uh, we might be able to be together to give praise to Holy God. That we might be able to learn from His Word. Um, I want to share just a little bit with you, but first we were asked to pray for a couple. For Is it Lily and Paul that their house burned down last night? And so this is your sister-in-law, is that right? Okay, so where do, where do they live? They live here in the area? In Richmond? Okay, all right, why don't we, let's just pause right now and pray for them. Heavenly Father, as we bow before you today, we know, dear God, that you're the God of comfort and the God of strength. And Lord, in this life, there are many things that happen many of them that are so difficult for us. And Lord, as we hear this, we know that, Lord, this is of great concern and a great difficulty. And so we pray for this couple. We pray for Lily and Paul and just pray that, that Lord, um, that they would draw closer to you during this time. And Father, that you would take care of them, minister to them, and minister to them through others. And so God, we just lift them up to you now. And just thank you for the privilege of praying for them. Just ask, dear God, that every aid that they can receive, every help that might be, uh, that they might need, Lord, would come to them, and that they would be overwhelmed by the love and the concern of their neighbors, their friends, their family. We give you praise for what you do. We thank you for being able to bring this to you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. Today is uh, a day that I pointed to in an email not a week ago, to, uh, two weeks ago, we talked about uh, today being a day that we would be committing ourselves uh, to being part of this church, to being part of this new church that God is building here, that God is, uh, where He is adding one person at a time, that we might build that foundation so that a church might remain here even until the time that Jesus Christ Himself returns. However soon, however uh, long that is, we pray that there will be a church in this town that Open Door Church will be able to minister to the people and minister the gospel at all times. And so I just want to read to you from the book of 1 Corinthians where that Paul writes, and he says this, he says, To the church, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by Him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This word church, which we are so familiar with, we need to understand the context of it. We need to understand just where it comes from and what it's about. You see, it comes from the Greek society. And the church, the word means the called out ones. And so these who were all citizens of a city, when there was a matter to be dealt with, a common purpose, a common need, a call would go out, and all of those who would come together to form a body to deal with that matter came together. That assembly was brought together. This is the word that we have for church. And what God is telling us is that we are those who have been saved in Christ. We are those who have been changed by the Lord Jesus Christ. And a call goes out. A new church is formed. And those who would agree to that purpose, those who would come together as a group and say, we will carry on the purpose, that is the church. That's the church. And he talks about the fact that 
with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. He says there is a commonality. We know that we're not the only ones who know Christ. We know that we're not the only ones that have identified with Christ. There are people all over our world that have come to Him. But He says you are the ones in your particular locale who have been called out of all of God's people to come together for a purpose. And so as we come to identify ourselves with a church, it is us saying the purpose of this church is my purpose. I join my hands with them. I will be mutually accountable with them. I will do my part in order that God might be glorified through this local body of believers. I praise God for the privilege of being able to serve Him through the body of a church, through that local body who covenant together to say, God has called us for a purpose. Let us join hands. Let us go forth for His glory. Let's pray one more time. Father, thank You for this group of believers. Father, thank You for those who already know that it is Your will for them to be a part of this body of believers, members of it. Lord, we know that there will be many who will be ministered to by the church. But I thank You for those who are willing to commit themselves to answer that call to be a part of this church, to help us in times going forward, to help us to fulfill that purpose, to take on responsibility, to take on accountability, or that You might be glorified. And so today, may there be in every heart a surrender to Your will, a desire to follow You, and a desire to minister to the others who are called together in this body. We praise You and thank You and ask that You would bless us now as we worship together. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Everybody come close. I want to ask, I need someone who knows how to read. Who likes, who knows how to read and likes to read? Come here. I have something for you to read, okay? It is in my Bible. It's in your Bible. And it is right here. And I want you to read the first six words. Count over six words on that circled verse, okay? Away? No, right here. This one. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, but forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgive you. All right. What were those first words? Be what to one another? Be kind to one another. Now tell me, can you explain to me what being kind is? What is being kind? What's your message you must do? Okay, I'm not sure I understood that. Be nice to each other. Be nice to each other. Respect someone. Respect them, that's good. What else? Be kind. And what is it to be kind? What can you tell me an example of being kind to someone? Of a child being kind to another child? What would that be? Do you have an example for me? Anybody have an example? If you hit somebody, you have to say sorry. <laughs> would that be being kind? That would be doing what you're supposed to do after you've been unkind. So is hitting somebody kind? No, no. So what is being kind? <laughs> what is being kind? I just forgot what I was about to say. What is being kind? You don't know. Okay, it sounds like your parents have a lot of work to do and the teachers are going to help you this morning. Being kind to each other. You know, that's, that's whenever you do something. Let me have this. That's when you do something that's nice to somebody, that you help somebody. If you see somebody that needs something, what should you do? Would you help them? That'd be being nice to them. If you know that somebody is, is having a problem and... You help them, that be being nice to them. 
Okay, well, I want you to think of ways to be nice to people because the Bible says that we're to do that with one another. Be nice, be kind, and help one another. Okay, let's pray and just ask God to help us learn to be kind to one another. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the children. I pray that you'll bless them now as they go to their classes. Help them each one to be kind to the other. And Lord, to... Think about the needs of someone else other than ourselves would be the, be the thing that we should do. And Lord, we'll do it for your glory. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, guys, thank you. You can go to Children's Church. The timing of the siren is that you might open your Bibles now. And so we appreciate the town cooperating with us and helping us to know when it's time to uh, open the Word of God. I'm going to be sharing with you today from the book of Ruth, a glorious, wonderful story that's there in the Old Testament. But let me go back just a little bit further than that for just a bit. You remember last week we talked about the fact that the people of Israel crossed over the Jordan River. They followed Joshua to victory. They claimed the land that had been promised to Abraham so long ago, so long before this. It was not an easy task that was ahead of them as they were sent that they might conquer the land. It was made that much more difficult because they were like us, human beings that were frail and faulty and had difficulties. But the one thing God asked them to do was to keep their eyes on Him keep their eyes off the pagan gods, to keep their eyes focused on Him, and to do what He instructed them to do. We find as we continue to read in the book of Joshua that, that their story was one of great successes, but also difficulty. But their story, as we open the book of Judges, just one book later, as their story continues, we see that it is also a story that is marred by failure to do that which is most important, and that is to follow the Lord completely, to follow Him fully. Let me read to you from the book of Judges, chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Here's what the Word says. It says, Now the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim, and he said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land which I have sworn to your fathers. And I said, listen to this, I will never break my covenant with you. And as for you, you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars. But you have not obeyed me. What is this you have done? Therefore I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they will become as thorns in your sides, and their gods will be a snare to you. When the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the sons of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept. So they named that place Boshim. And there they sacrificed to the Lord. you know what that word means? It means weeping. Oh, the tears that ought to fill the eyes of the people of God who refuse to keep their eyes on Him and who disobey the Lord. It should be a place of weeping. It should be a place of tears. Now you noticed in that passage of Scripture that it was the angel of the Lord who came up from Gilgal to this place, Bochim. But that angel of the Lord, that angel of Jehovah says, I will never break my covenant with you. Who is this angel of Jehovah? Who is this angel of the Lord at this time? Who is it? There's nothing, no one else but the Lord Jesus Christ in that Old Testament appearance here. Read the words and you'll see that it must be God who is speaking to them. God the Son, the messenger. The writer of the book of Judges then records for us the death of their leader. Another great leader of the people of Israel, has gone on to be with the Lord. At the age of 110, Joshua dies. And one by one, the people of that generation, the people of the generation who witnessed and participated in the crossing of the Jordan River, 
the ones who participated in the marching around the walls of the city of Jericho to see those walls fall down flat. One by one, they began to pass on. They died, and another generation came. Another generation arose who, verse 10 of that same chapter says, did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which He had done for Israel. Have you ever thought about the fact that we're only one generation away from a godless society, a totally godless society? We're only one generation away if these little children that we teach, if they stop following the Lord, what a tragedy that would be. He writes here about a people of Israel. He said they were not the ones who experienced the great miracles and they forgot what God had done. In other words, they turned their backs on God. In fact, in verses 11 and 12, we read these words, Then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals, and they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed themselves down to them. Thus they provoked the Lord to anger. You know what God did with them? He removed His hand of protection from off of them, and their enemies gained advantage over them. And yet remember that God had said to them, I will never break my covenant with you. You know, even when we are faithless, that God is faithful. Do you know He never turns His back upon His people? When He makes a promise, He keeps that promise. And so in His great mercy, what He did with Israel, though a generation had arisen that did not remember the great works of God, yet God had mercy upon them and He sent them leaders. Those leaders referred to as judges. Listen to what it says in verse 8. Verse 18 of that same uh, chapter. It says, When the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them from the hands of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who oppressed and afflicted them. But it came about when the judge died that they would turn back and act more corruptly than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and bow down to them. They did not abandon their practices or their stubborn ways. You read the book of Judges and you see the cycle was repeated over and over and over again. Again, the land of promise was a land of glorious victories followed by devastating defeats over and over and over again. God was faithful to them, but they were not faithful to God. Now this morning I've chosen not to share with you the story of some of those great leaders like Gideon. Oh, we could talk, we could have a whole series of messages talking about Gideon and his great faith and how he led the people of God to victory then we would have to read about how the people, after he was gone, went back to their old ways. We could read about other great judges that there were that are written for us, that are told us, uh, that we're talked to in the book of Judges. People like Samson. And you know, only know a little about Samson, but read about this man. For he is also listed among those who were people of faith. But instead of talking about some of those judges, I want to share with you the story of a young woman who lived in the time of the judges. In this time when the people of Israel were not experiencing all the glory that God wanted for them, they were not experiencing all the blessings that God wanted for them. In fact, a famine had come into the land. And as the story begins, that famine is just now coming to a close. The woman I want to talk to you about is a woman by the name of Ruth. She was not an Israelite. She was instead a Moabite. Her story, as we read it, is intertwined with her mother-in-law, a lady by the name of Naomi. Now as we open the book of Ruth, which follows immediately after the book of Judges, we find that Naomi has left her home and gone with her husband to Moab during a time of famine. And there, as she's there, her husband dies her two sons marry local Moabite girls, and then each of those sons also dies. Now, it didn't happen quite that quickly, but I'm in a hurry, so, so that's what happened. They went. 
and death came into that family. There were problems, and so you have Naomi left and her two daughters-in-law, Moabite. Moabites, both of them. At any rate, Naomi heard about the famine, that the famine in Bethlehem was over, so she decided that she was ready to return home. If you know anything about that time period, you know that a woman on her own is in great difficulty. She was penniless, and she knew that she, even as she returned, that she was going to have to depend upon the kindness of others. And thus, in kindness to them, she begs her two daughters-in-law to go back to their family, to go back to their home, that they might be able to marry some good Moabite young men and that they might be taken care of. She is thinking about them when she says, you go back. Because she knows what she's returning to. She knows that she's going back to a place where she has nothing. Well, you know the story that one of those daughters-in-law turns back. But the other one, Ruth, refuses to do so. It says in the book of Ruth in chapter 1, verse 22, So Naomi returned, and with her, Ruth, the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, who returned from the land of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. These two women had each other, and they had nobody else. Well, into that picture of great need comes a man by the name of Boaz. And as soon as he is introduced, you get a sense that he is going to be the one who is going to be the hero for Ruth and for Naomi. That he's the one that God has sent into their lives that their needs might be met. Boaz. In fact, it says in chapter 2, verse 1, Now Naomi had a kinsman of her husband a man of great wealth, of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Now, Elimelech was Naomi's husband that has passed away. This is one of his relatives, one of his family. Now, the story here in the book of Ruth is a love story. It is the story of an older, wealthy Israelite man falling in love with a young, poor, Moabite widow. And if you haven't read your biblical genealogies lately, I will give you a little bit of a fast forward and tell you that Ruth and Boaz become the great-grandparents of one that you might know his name, the greatest king of Israel, David. And you probably know that this same David was an ancestor of Mary and Joseph and of their son, Jesus, a Moabitess in the lineage of Christ, one by the name of Ruth. Boaz becomes to Ruth what was known in that time as a kinsman redeemer. Now you will understand what that means as the story unfolds, folds, so join me as we consider uh, this third chapter of the book of Ruth. I want you to notice, first of all, the provision of a kinsman redeemer. Listen to Naomi as she expresses her desire for Ruth and her other daughter-in-law in chapter 1, verse 9, when she tried to get them to return to their homeland, to return to their family. Here's what she said. She said, May the Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. And then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. Now Ruth's future was one of hardship if she remained unmarried. Naomi says that what she wants her to find is rest. Well, that word rest is a word which means security, which in that day could only come for a woman through marriage. But Ruth is not deterred. She is going with Naomi back to Bethlehem. She is going to leave her people, go with Naomi, and she says, your people will be my people, and your God is going to be my God. When they arrive, Ruth, being the young, healthy woman, Naomi, neither young and possibly not very healthy, when they arrive, Ruth goes into the fields to glean enough food from the edges of the fields in order that the two of them can eat. 
You see in the Old Testament, the landowners would to were told to leave a little bit of grain on the sides of the fields in order that the poor might come and might have something to eat. So she goes to a field knowing that there will be some provision there and she will be able to do that. Now remember, she is a Moabite. That promise was not given to the Moabites. She knows that there is provision that is made, but she's not sure that she's going to be able to take part in this. Well... It just so happened that the field in which she gleaned belonged to that man by the name of Boaz. Isn't it great? I mean, out of all the people there, God would lead her to the field of Boaz. And as she comes to that field, he takes notice of her immediately and he speaks to her. As I said, she was afraid that she was a Moabite, not an Israelite, that she would not be allowed to glean in the field. So here the landowner is coming to her, speaking to her, and I'm sure she wonders what is going to happen next. But instead of her, him telling her, you have no right to this, this is for the poor of Israel, instead, she is given a promise of both provision and protection. Kindness. Listen to chapter 2, verse 10. It says, Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? But you read and you find that his kindness, his grace was extended even further. It says in verse 14 that at mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here, that you may eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers, and he served her roasted grain, and she ate and was satisfied and had some left. When she rose to glean, Boaz commanded his servant, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not insult her. Also you shall purposely pull out for her some grain from the bundles, and leave it that she may glean, and do not rebuke her. What a blessing. What a glorious blessing that Ruth has. You can imagine how excited she is as she has more than what she needs. It has been provided. Now when Ruth returned to Naomi with about a bushel of grain, can you imagine Naomi's amazement? So she asked, who is it? How did you come by this? Where did, were you gleaning? And when Ruth said that this man's name, the owner of the land was named Boaz, Naomi knew that God was up to something. You know, mothers-in-law, they know those things. She knew that God was up to something. Verse 20 says, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed of the Lord, who has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and to the dead. Again, Naomi said to her, the man is our relative. He is one of our closest relatives. And Naomi knew that God had made provision for a widow by providing someone called a kinsman redeemer. Well, Boaz qualified. That's the reason that Naomi is saying the man is a relative. He is one of our closest relatives. Ruth would return to the field. She would glean again, but Naomi wanted to help the situation along just a bit. Sometimes mothers-in-law do that as well. Or maybe just moms. Chapter 3 begins with these words. It says, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you that it may be well with you? Now is not Boaz our kinsman? with whose maids you were. Behold, he winnows barley at the threshing floor tonight. I mean, there's no time like the present. Now, so that we will understand what Naomi knew and so that we can appreciate how this relates to us, I need to share with you that in order to be a kinsman, kinsman redeemer, certain qualifications had to be met. The first of these was that he had to be a blood relative. Now, Boaz qualified because he was related to Naomi's husband, Elimelech. 
I may as well tell you now that this story is not just a love story about Boaz and Ruth. God has included it in His Word as more than that. We know that it is not just that she and Boaz are part of the ancestry of Jesus. That is important. But it's important primarily... This story is important primarily because it is an Old Testament picture that helps us to understand Jesus and His love for us. Okay? Are you with me? Think about it. Now, we, like Ruth, had a bleak future. I mean, the Bible says you're dead in trespasses and in sin. The Bible tells us that if we die in that fashion, that we're going to be separated from, from God forever. I don't know how much graver a situation can be than that to think that when this life is over, no matter how much good that you have done, that despite all of your good efforts, despite all of your good works, that you are still in bondage and will be that way for all of eternity. The future was pretty bleak. The truth is that we needed a Savior. We needed someone to rescue us. And Jesus is the one who had all the qualities of the kinsman's kinsman redeemer. Now, I said that this kinsman redeemer had to be a blood relative. Well, we know that Jesus is the divine Son of our Father in heaven. He has that eternal relationship with the Father, the Father and the Son. But we also know that He is a blood relative of ours because He came in the flesh. He was born in the flesh. He came in the likeness of man. And when He did, He took upon Himself our image so that He might be our kinsman, redeemer. A second qualification was this. He had to be a sufficiently wealthy relative. Now, just because someone desires to help in a time of need does not mean that that person is going to be able to be of any help. Instead, he had to be able, if he were to be the kinsman's redeemer, to pay off all of that person's debts that they might have occurred and to buy back any family land that was sold in order to meet debts previously. And so he had to come up with cash. He had to come up with a way to buy that person out of bondage, to, buy, to restore to that person their family land. And so Boaz, we know, was qualified because he is said in chapter 2, verse 1, to have been a man of great, Wealth. Now, that wasn't an easy thing to achieve in that day because they have just come out of a time of famine. But God has blessed Boaz. We know that Christ is distinguished above all who have ever pretended to be the hope for mankind, who have ever pretended that they were Lord, that they were Savior, but He is the only one who is able to pay the price to remove mankind from bondage. He is the only one that could reclaim that which has been sold by man to Satan through man's disobedience. He's the only one who could do that. And so he certainly is sufficiently wealthy because, you see, the price of that release was not measured in terms of bank accounts. But instead, the price that was paid for us was the price of innocent, totally sinless blood that was shed on our behalf. Only Jesus was qualified to do that. Our kinsman's, kinsman redeemer. We needed our sins to be taken care of, to be covered by blood. Only Jesus was capable of doing that. The third thing was this person had to be a willing relative. Okay, he had to be a close relative. He had to have the money to be able to do it. But he also had to be willing to do so because the kinsman could refuse to redeem. So Boaz had to be willing to buy back the forfeited property and to take on a wife. Now that is not something you do lightly. Should not do it lightly. Naomi saw the sovereign hand of God working in Ruth's life, and she believed that Boaz would be willing to do so, and she knew that he was able to do so. Folks, I am so glad that Jesus was willing to do what he is able to do, that he voluntarily became our kinsman 
Redeemer, that He voluntarily laid His life down for us. We know that being who He was, that He was capable of it, but He did so willingly. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, He says, I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it back up again. Jesus was willing to do what needed to be done, and only He could do it. If he had refused, then we would still be in bondage. And we would be without hope. The story continues. Not only is there the provision of a kinsman redeemer, there is the appeal that we see that is made to the kinsman redeemer. Look at verse 2. It says, she says, Now is not Boaz our kinsman with whose maids you were? Behold, he winnows barley at the threshing floor tonight. Now the threshing floor was a flat, hard area that uh, was on a slightly raised platform on a hill. In threshing the grain, it was the grain was beaten out from the stalks, stalks, and then in winnowing, the grain was thrown into the air, and the wind carried away the chaff. The grain was then removed from the threshing floor, and it was placed in heaps that it might be sold or that it might be stored away. The people of Bethlehem would take turns using the threshing floor. And it was Boaz's time to be there. Now the time of threshing and winnowing was a time of great festivity and great rejoicing because this is speaking of the harvest. And Naomi knew that Boaz was threshing his grain on that very day. She also knew that Boaz would be sleeping near his grain that night in order to protect it. Now, when we first hear about Ruth and what her mother-in-law tells her to do, her actions may seem to be a little bit forward. At times, men, usually when it's just men, you know, we may get to talking about um, all that our wives did in chasing us and, and uh, you know, courting us, all that they did to get our attention. Well, none of your stories can match the story that Boaz was able to tell. Read what Ruth is told by Naomi, beginning in verse 3. She says this to her daughter-in-law. She says, Wash yourself, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your best clothes, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. It shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies, and you shall go and uncover his feet and lie down. Then he will tell you what you shall do. She said to her, all that you say, I will do. Can you imagine? Verse 3, when she's told to put on her best clothes, well, the word that is translated clothes here specifically refers to an outer garment that Ruth was to wear to keep her identity from being detected. She wasn't to put on her finest clothes so that she could draw attention, but she was to put on this garment that would hide her identity. And what Ruth does here. It's not as it might seem. What she was doing was she was making an appeal to Boaz to be her kinsman redeemer. She was declaring to him that she wanted no other, that she wanted to be his wife. Now, Boaz was a much older man, and apparently he felt that Ruth would have plenty of opportunities to marry one of those younger men of the village. So you see, like many men today, he needed a nudge in order that he might know this lady's intentions, that he might be able to, to realize that she would respond to him. He dared not to believe it before. But what is illustrated in her actions is a desire for protection. You see, Ruth waited until Boaz was asleep as he lay by the grain to guard it, and then she lifted the cover at his feet, and she lay down at his feet. Listen to how the scriptures record it. Verse 6. So she went down to the threshing floor, and she did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and she came secretly and uncovered his feet and lay down. 
And I need to tell you, there was nothing that was improper about this. This is a symbolic act, and it was commonly understood as a desire to be protected. It was, to be sure, a proposal of marriage. It was, to be sure, to say, if you ask me, I will say, yes. It was also an act of humility. Can you imagine? You ladies say, I, I'd never do that. I would never be so forward as that. Well, it was an act of humility. Boaz was startled, the Scripture says, as he awoke in the darkness and felt someone at his feet. And notice that she did not lay down at his side. She lay down at his feet. Because to be at his feet showed her humility. Notice that when she identifies herself, she calls herself his maid or his servant. It says in verse 8, it happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled and bent forward, and behold, a woman was lying at his feet. He said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth. You're made. An act of humility. But also it is a request for acceptance. And so she goes on in verse 9 to say, So spread your covering over your maid, for you are a close relative. In other words, you are the one who I desire to be my kinsman, Redeemer. You see, the spreading, the symbol of spreading a garment over a widow was a common identification of claiming that widow in marriage. Now, as you have listened to this and tried to understand the culture, let me ask you a question. Does this not symbolize our coming to Jesus to seek His protection as we realize that He is the only one who can protect us from our future that we would be certain to have without Him a future of disappointment in life and agony in eternity? Do we not need to come to Him and say we are not worthy? Do we not need to come to Him in all humility and lie at His feet? and say, I am here that you might protect me. We come to Him submissively, counting on no worth of our own. We come accepting the truth that He can redeem us and believing that He wants to redeem us. And we are even more helpless than the Old Testament widow, but we trust all that we are to Him. We trust that perfect kinsman redeemer who has already paid the price for our release from sin and its penalty. We see this glorious appeal to the kinsman redeemer. And I pray that you have had that experience where you've come to the Lord Jesus Christ saying, I am nothing and I have nothing to offer. Ruth had no bank accounts that she could say, listen, Boaz, we'd make a pretty good business team. She had nothing to offer. And that's exactly the way it is with you and me. We've got nothing to add to the mix. He has paid it all. All we can do is accept what He has done. Let's look further in the story, for I want you to see the security that is found in the kinsman redeemer. Because you see, Boaz not only accepted Ruth's proposal, but he does so joyfully. There is nothing that he could desire that would have been any greater of a blessing to him. We see the security of his assuring promises. Verses 10 and 11. It says, Then he said, May you be blessed of the Lord, my daughter. You have shown your last kindness to be better than the first by not going after young men, whether poor or rich. Now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you whatever you ask. For all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. She has not shamed herself. She has done only that which is proper. We see here that Boaz promises anew and afresh that Ruth's needs are going to be met, that everything is going to be taken care of as soon as possible. She has not proposed anything that was not already on his mind. He did not have to inquire from someone else and say, now wait a minute, Ruth, I haven't known you very long. Let me check your references before we go any further with this. No, this man was already interested in her. He had heard the townspeople talking about her. She had a good reputation among the people. He knew the kindness that she had shown to her mother-in-law, Naomi. He knows that she is a woman of excellence. In fact, it appears that Boaz had even looked into the legal prospects before 
she ever came to him. He had researched the possibility of marriage before it was even proposed, and yet there was a complication. There was a relative of closer kin than he was. But the gentle, compassionate Boaz would do all that he could to remove the obstacles, and he knew that if it was God's will for the two of them to be married, that those obstacles would be taken out of the way, and that he would be able to be her husband, indeed her kinsman, Redeemer. He says to Ruth, you just rest, just trust me. Do you know that's what Jesus told me when I came to Him? He said, you just rest and trust me. I'll make sure that it happens. I had no confidence in myself whatsoever. But the, the Lord, when I came to Him, He just said, just trust me. And since that time, I've known that I belong to Him. And it doesn't matter about my failures. If I fall short, which I do, then He still, I belong to Him. Remember, He told Israel, even in the time of their sin, He said, I will keep my covenant promise to you. And He keeps His covenant promise to us. Rest. He says in verse 12, Now it is true, I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. Remain this night, and when morning comes, if he will redeem you good, let him redeem you. But if he does not wish to redeem you, then I will redeem you as the Lord lives. Lie down until morning. Oh, the assurances that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of our needs are met, all of our worries, all of our fears are removed. We can rest in His promises. Notice with me the security of immediate evidence of His love. It says, beginning in verse 14, So she lay at His feet until morning and rose before one could recognize another. And He said, Let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Again He said, Give me the cloak that is on you and hold it. So she held it and He measured six measures of barley and laid it on her. Then she went into the city. When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, How did it go, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done for her. She said, These six measures of barley he gave to me, for he said, Do not go to your mother-in-law empty-handed. The barley that he gave her was a gift for Naomi, an evidence that Boaz intended to take care of Ruth, to marry Ruth. Now, Naomi was in the position of parent, and she would have to give her consent to the marriage. He probably knew what we know. She was already in approval. But he says, take this to Naomi. You see, Boaz's promise is no empty promise. In fact, you know what this is? He gives her 60 pounds of barley and says to her, take that. 60 pounds of barley. One day, she must have been a strong young woman to carry that home. And that wasn't a test, though. Okay, It wasn't a test. It was a blessing. Probably he would have given her twice that much if he thought she could have handled it. You know what? Sometimes God gives us blessings. And He doesn't give us more because we can't handle it at that moment. All we can carry is the 60 pounds of blessing. He'd give us 120 if we could handle it right then, but He'll save the other 60 for a little bit later. How blessed we are that we have such a relationship with Almighty God. You say, well, I'd love to have so many blessings that I could barely carry them. Well, begin to read the Scriptures, see what you have in your relationship with Jesus. I can't fathom all that is mine because I belong to Him. He loads us daily with benefits. His promises are not empty. Our immediate evidence of His love for us is the receiving of the Holy Spirit into our lives, who is Himself the earnest of our salvation, our guarantee that Christ will keep His promise. That is a blessing that is immeasurable, a gift that we experience more fully as we grow every day in our relationship with the Lord. Let's look again. Look at verse 18. I want you to see the security of His purposeful action. For it says in verse 18, Then she said, Wait, my daughter, until you know how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest until he has settled it today. Don't worry about it. Boaz isn't going to forget. Boaz is going to be doing this immediately. 
And there would be no delay in Boaz making it possible for the marriage to occur. Even so, know that our Lord does not delay in keeping His promises. In fact, He has already settled the matter of us coming to Him. You remember what Romans 5, 8 says? It says, but God demonstrates His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The provision has already been made for our greatest need to be met. You see, there is nothing else for Him to do. And once you have accepted His love, there is nothing else for you to do. The entire matter is settled. Now you know the end to Ruth's story. Boaz completes the transaction and they live happily ever after. They could not have imagined that they would be the ancestors of the one who would be the kinsman redeemer for all who would receive him as Lord. How about your story? How is your story going to end? Oh, we know that a kinsman redeemer has been provided for you. He is well qualified and he is willing. As Naomi spoke to Ruth, even so the Holy Spirit of God has spoken to you, encouraging you to place all of your faith in Christ, to allow Him to be your protection, to allow Him to be the one who daily takes care of your needs. Walking every day with Him. It helps you picture Boaz and Ruth. This older man who says, oh, what a blessing God has given me and given me this wife. Picture yourself as being that bride who is being adored by the kinsman redeemer. Picture yourself in that relationship with the Lord. You see, there's great security to be found in Jesus. You can claim His promises as your own. You can receive the Holy Spirit in your life to assure you, to guide you, and commit everything that you are into His hand. And as I said, as soon as you put your faith and trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to live within you. That He might provide that for you. Boaz and Ruth. A marvelous story, a wonderful story. A story of redemption. And I pray that every one of you realize that you have a story of redemption. And that you know that you have accepted the payment that Christ has made. That you know for sure that you have a relationship with Him. Let's bow together and go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you that you have given us this account, that you have shared this story with us. I pray that we might understand more and more about our relationship with you, and we might share with others great promises that you've given us and the joy that there is in the assurance that we are yours. Bless us, Lord. For you already are our blessing. Lord, there are people here who are struggling. People here who have questions. I pray that your Holy Spirit would lead them into your word, that those questions might be answered. And I pray, dear God, that you would open your word to them, that your scripture may resolve those struggles. Lord, we began this service by praying for a family who've just gone through a devastating event. And Lord, our sympathy goes out to them. And Lord, as we talk about Jesus being our Savior. 
our hearts go out to all of those who don't realize that, who think somehow that by coming to a decision of salvation that they're giving something up. Oh, what lies the evil one tells. I pray you'll help them, help us to tell them of the great joy there is in walking with you and belonging to you. Thank you for the story of Ruth that in a time of great difficulty in Israel, in a time when the leadership was good for a time and then bad, Lord, yet you cared about this young widow and her mother-in-law and you made provision for them even as you will for us. Bless us, Lord Jesus. I want to ask you to keep your heads bowed just for a moment. Is there something that you need to turn over to the Lord? Is there something that you need to talk with Him about? Take these few moments and do that. If there's a decision that you need to make, Open your heart to Him. He is the answer for your need.